Hello, Professor Doshi. Uh, can you hear us? Um, Riyaz, hi, this is Keshav here. Hi, Keshav. Hi. Um, he has uh, gone for a bath right now, so he'll be out in like 10 minutes or something. All right. So we'll uh, start with the recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like to do a small formal uh, introduction, uh, even though it's uh, not really necessary for Doshi, but, uh, for good form. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I'll just uh, keep this on unmute and the video closed for now until he uh, comes back. Maybe that would be better now. Uh, Professor Shaya, will you do a short introduction to uh, Doshi and then we can begin in the context of the studio, perhaps? Yes. Um, well, all of you, welcome this morning to this talk. Today we have two of them, both from very, very eminent speakers. The first one in the morning is by Balkrishna Doshi, a Pritzker Prize winner and great architect, educator, teacher, and a wonderful human being. I don't think we need more introduction than that. Um, it was felt, he felt, that it would be better to do a conversation rather than talk to a screen. So instead of recording a talk, um, we had a small, conversation yesterday uh, of which a recording has been made and it is now being put on. It's wonderful that we are able to meet on the screen at least after such yeah, a yeah, We are very clear and nice, nice to see both, both of each one's face yes. and then the reaction is very close. No? So you are already in the Realm of theater. Yeah. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Where, where expression and experience and memories go together. Mm. Theater, though. Yes. yes. So, yes, it's a wonderful, wonderful simile that you have brought out. The city is also like a theater, no? Yes. That there are many actors on the street. Not only city, life itself is a theater. Huh. Only we never think that way. Huh. Life, even if when you look at the mirror every morning, mm. you're always wondering who you are, what you are, and then you start acting without knowing. So <laughs> the nature of a human being is a part of self-observation, self-possession, and self-delight. Self-delight. I think, you know, you dream, you know, you go into your own self because it's very personal. So hmm. actually, when you are personal, you are completely free. And suddenly, the images trigger many memories. And little later, those memories have stories. Yes. And those stories are connected to your discipline or the thing that you enjoy. So, if you see even a child, when they look at the mirror, they immediately they want to express something which otherwise they would not have. Yes. So, it frees. And then in that image and the dream, unexpected thoughts come up. And there are no limits. So, actually, it is the only time when we are with ourselves. Hmm. There is nobody in between. You can get upset, you can feel happy, you can love, you can hate, you may want to sleep. So the question is, what is the nature of a human being? And what is it that the human being is searching? One. The second is, how do you describe a human being? 
And I think that is where the question starts. Because all the creations, all the dialogue, all the discussions are going on beyond the human being, but they are all done by human being. But we never talk about this. And only in the esoteric world, they talk of the spirit. Because the motivation of action and expression comes from the spirit which is dormant inside. And I think that is where the whole question is. Why? How? Sense of wonder. Actually, when you are in the mirror in the front, in the first thing in the morning, you wonder. And if you had gone to a theater somewhere and party was there and you were colored, and then you came home and slept the next morning, when you get up and look at the mirror, you say, oh my God, what happened? And suddenly stories after stories come. And then after a while, you become a child. Yeah, do, you All, think the, huh? do you think the whole of life is like that? Where we, it is uh, like that. Every morning, that is what I found. And that is why I, I enjoy looking at the mirror. Mm. It's actually a lot of myths have happened because the person who is in the, in the story, whether female or male, he or she has seen the image of his or her face in the reflection of the water, mm. which was still. Mm. Shakuntal, all epics, they start from this only. Suddenly you look into the mirror and then you begin to get out. You are, you are awakened actually. Mm. And that awakening then triggers everything. There is no limitation. So Doshi here, right now you talked about the still water in yes. which you could see the reflection. That's and that right. means uh, that stillness is important for that reflection to be visible. If it is very um, disturbed, then the reflection will not be visible. Uh, but also, can we see our reflection in another human being? A loved human being or a human being who we feel sympathy with? I think there is an invisible, intense connection with ourselves. When you see someone else, it's not you. So, most important thing is, at what point of time you are becoming whole and what time you are separated and you become entities. Mm. And I think this is where the whole life is. Yes. Because when you see somebody else or when you see something outside you, you start making judgments. Images come, stories come, past experiences come because there is a thin line and it says, I am there or I am not there. This and that, that is what happens. But in the real way, when you look at the mirror yourself, hmm. there are no barriers. You can also act, you can become crooked, you can become jovial, you can laugh, you can smile. Because actually there is a conversation within yourself. And there are no barriers. And important thing then is, can we really, whenever we do something or whenever we have experienced something or whenever, even when we go to the school and talk about an episode, are we outside or are we ourselves? Have you become one or have you become an outsider? Sure. And this is something which the life teaches us. And that lesson of life is very important because in the eyes, when something is detached, the brain starts working. 
and then there are judgments, prejudices, experiences, and the intellectual question, why, how, when. But when you are in front of that, you know, you are free. The universe becomes you. And actually, that is where we use the word consciousness. Because your consciousness is part of you. But when you look at the image, the consciousness gets suddenly detached and judgment begins to happen. So when you look at architecture or when you look at a building or when you read a story, are you really judging it, looking it, experiencing it as if it is one integral whole or it is the mind which has now come, which was not there before and a judgment comes. Which is fragmenting that's, it. That's right. And that is the time you know what it is. And the creation really happens when you have no judgment and you are free. And it doesn't matter because there is no loss or no gain. Because though if you have no loss and no gain, you are free because the sun is the way you deal with your own children. It is sharing only, purely sharing, purely becoming one whole and also light. So if you look at all the symbols which are created, whether it is in the temple or it is in the myth or whatnot, I think that is where you begin to see how to do. So when you talked about plasma, we had a discussion in Dhaka together. And I told him something which I thought maybe he will still remember if we recall. I said, we have two words in India. Surgeon and Visarjan. And I said that surgeon and Visarjan is connected to anticipation. You create, you dissolve, but there is an anticipation that it will come back. And that is our ritual. And that ritual is that longing. And that is our myth. And that myth gives us freedom to choose. And I think this is a very, very fundamental thing of our religion. And all our things that we do, surgeon, then celebration, then visarjan, and recreation and anticipation. And I think those are the things which we normally don't talk about. Yes. Suppose you see a building and then you say, but what do you think about this building if it had happened this or that? Our mind, rational mind goes into this. We are not mindful there. We make judgment. So important thing is, is judgment necessary at all when you create? Or you create, it happens, it emerges, and then there is no judgment. It is like a mother and a child. So when is, when is it that we can talk about architecture or creation or space without getting connected? Are you an outsider? Are you a third party? And I think that is an important issue to talk about. But unfortunately, because we are not a third party, our creation is not going to be as beautiful, delicious, uh, unusual, light-hearted as we would be looking at it as something outside us. So very often it is nice to look at your photograph of your own building and reflect it on the screen or project it on the screen and then you see. 
after a few minutes, if it is still there, then you really wonder. And I think that wonder is very beautiful. That is where, so all the schools which you must have a room where there are, one room has mirrors. At least one mirror, if not two. Because each one will see there, but it is not there. It's not true. So the whole thing is connected to myth. Freedom. And I was very happy when Madame Arshia talked about myth and when she said that a story to hoti hai, mango to abhi bhi tha ho mere paas aur aaya ye ram ram ke vakat ka hai and all kinds of stories that she talked about. It was so good to that because what is it? What is myth? We have taken myth as absolute real but an actually reality we talk of myth. When you go on the road and something is happening, an accident takes place, we pass by. Because for us it is myth. But if it was somebody related to us, then it was not a myth, we won't go from there. So the whole life, whole discourse is connected to these things. So surgeon and visurgeon and myth, I put them together in my general discourse. Because to me, they are all part and parcel. So when we talked about Jaipur, and when we talked about Maharaj Jai Singh, and when I said that the beauty of Maharaj Jai Singh was that he was an astronomer. So to him, that galaxy was very far and very near. For him, that galaxy existed there, but he knew what that galaxy is, and he, was a, he had an observer. And he looked at it there and he says, I must share it with everybody. And everybody someday must look at it. The children must see, other people must see, and they must see as game. So what does he do? He takes away that astronomical instruments and makes them accessible to people as if they are toys. And not only that, but on the main road of Jaipur. He places very near there in such a way that it is really a child's dream. So beauty of Maharaja Jai Singh's understanding, you know, poet, religious man, thinking about global things and looking at the stars. He says, I am going to, I feel delightful. I am enjoying. I am so happy. So he says, why not share that happiness? So he makes those objects of such a scale that the whole city can come there and everybody can walk and you can get lost there. Today we have all the restrictions so we don't do it. But if they were allowed and if people were there, all those yantras and the shadows that they cast and the kind of position that do, do I went there a couple of times and very often I would sit there in one place where the curvature is there and you sit there and you are in a different position because your posture is different. But then you slide slightly and suddenly your eyes go to that yantra and then you look at that yantra and you see the dial moving. You wonder where is the light, where is the shadow, where is the time? So do we ever talk in our discussions about how do we lose the sense of time, sense of place, and sense of I-ness? I think that's something which we can talk perhaps. I don't know. Actually, you took me to another world. Because you talked about the sky. And you talked about the limitless and the galaxies and the wonder. You talked about delight. Yes. Normally, we talk about the city as if it is a place of much suffering, labor, day after day doing the same thing. Yeah. And being caught in life. 
do you think the city has become outdated? That we have to find another story or another myth, another reflection of ourselves somewhere, which will bring a different delight. Yeah, actually, if I remember Khan, Hmm. Khan, uh, he used to come very often and he was always hunting for the books of one particular writer, I don't remember now, Arabian Nights, hmm. old books. So one day we found in the old bookshop about 20 books, very heavy. He carried them with him on the flight. And I was wondering, what is that, you know? Then you start reading Arabian Nights, and one of the keys that it is endless. A story which is going on timelessly. So what is the idea of a story? What is the idea of the timelessness? And we never talk about this. We always talk about a function as if it has the beginning and an end. When will we talk life is timeless, relations are timeless, the galaxies are timeless, and memories are timeless. We architecture-wise, we talk of freezing time. We have reduced that time so much that now there is nothing left in architecture. You know, we have reversed it. We talk about less time not timeless. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is the funny part. <laughs> yes, but this, this longing that you are talking about, you know, you said that there is surgeon, then there is visurgeon, and there is a longing, there is an um, anticipation. Yes. In this time now, today, when all this has happened in the world, do you see some longing? Well, there's fear. Fear of going away, fear of losing ourselves. So, a child's mind, there is no loss. In those observatories, when you go there, you don't think at all about time or anything. You are there and you are connected to the cosmos. And there is the presence of the sun and the shadows. Now, was a, isn't not part of architecture or it is a part of instrument or it is a part of life. So we have to now learn to dis completely remove the words which are making us frozen architecture, building, space, function, relationship. Are they not compartments? Supposing that we remove this and we start talking, what would be the game like? Isn't this wonderful to think like that? Yes, yes. I mean, we have seminars, we have discussions, but what, what is, the, they are all time bound. And now with all these videos and this, what you call, I don't know. But whenever we meet and we have this one hour, but why, why not really just talk about, all right, it can be one hour or it is infinite. What has happened is we have narrowed down and we come to building. Then we come to space and we come to that space where there is a staircase and there is a wall and there is a door and there is a terrace and it has a character. So we have really gradually brought it down to we also as a human being, we have forgotten we are being, not human being. So, so my feeling is we should really take away these adverbs and take the words just like that. Hmm. You see, what reminded me a few days back was my journey to the zoo. Hmm. Tejal, uh, Manish, uh, Jessica and Kushnu, I would take them to the zoo. 
So one day I went to the zoo there, you know, also, and I'm telling them, this is this animal, this is this bird, this is this tree. Now as I grow, I remember those days of looking at it. And then I said, how did nature create so many kinds of creatures? There is no limit. Some go below ground, some go fly above, some go in water, some eat only the air, some move their face, some walk, some jump, some fly. And when I look at all these infinite variations, and not only infinite variation, their lifetime activities or their purpose, I wonder where it has come from. And then I saw one day that experience that, you know, I had gone to the washroom and some dirt, you know, was left by mistake. I neglected it. A little later I come and it was all cleaned. Slowly I said, how come? Who came? Then I created purposefully the dirt in the bathroom. And then I saw in one hour, ants came. From where did they come? How did they know? And in one hour, it was all cleaned. They carried everything. So nature is the only one where inherently they are made conscious of what they are supposed to be without splitting their heads. They know the target, you know, like the flowers bloom. I look at offer the lotus flower and I wonder, you know, that wow, in the sunlight, sunset, you know, they built and it closes and the morning sun, you know, gradually the petals open. So you look at the sun and then you wonder, you know, how come, who is their guide? So there is in nature, the same thing that I'm talking about or Jai Singh talked about was that you will by the kind of things you do, you will create in that individual or a person a reaction and that reaction will make things part and parcel of you. Totally assimilated. When I climb on those steps of Jantar Mantar or in that Yantras, I forget because I touch them. I walk, I see them and I look at shadows and my mind changes. I don't know whether they are functional, not functional, etc. I get lost. So what I have been trying to do is, is it possible that we can get lost in what we do? Mm. Our creation, does it have to be a prescribed formula by which a historian is supposed to analyze it and give it a, some kind of a critic? Is it to be measured? And I think this is what I have been questioning as an architect. How do we disconnect and disconnect? all the time, whatever space we go. Like sun comes in the morning and disappears and the light and shadow happens. We notice it, but we slowly, when the shadow changes, we get delighted. And then we find something else. So there is that unknown factor which induces us to rediscover something that we have observe or we might observe. Then the question comes of my teacher. Huh. So my teacher was always raising question but leaving it halfway. He would draw something and he would say, now you, you then you, he will not say anything. And then you have to say, but 
what is it now? There is there a limb there? Is there a tree there? Is there something else? So the good teacher talks about and creates voids in between, gaps, for the learner to discover for himself and connect them in such a link that that link then gives him a true connection. Mm. So it is like what we do, Kumbhak. Mm. Yes. It's like Kumbhak Jese, a Kumbhak Ma Ache, it is a Tamne Kau, Konarak Temple, Sun Temple in Konarak. Yes. I could never believe. I was so fascinated by that temple that how come that they can create this on a seashore? And it is the Sun Temple offering to the Sun. But I saw two major examples there. When I saw it years ago, photograph, and there was an elephant, and on the elephant, there was a lion jumping on the back of the elephant as if it is going to now kill the elephant. I could not understand this. First of all, and that elephant is crawling, and the trunk is bent like this. So I went there, I went there again, and I saw that the elephant was not at all worried or concerned. The elephant was relaxed. The eyes were easy, the trunk, the skin, everything was lying. And the lion was on top. It's like a grandchild on top of a grandfather. We're playing the game. Now, this is the entry to the temple. Why that temple is introduced like this? Then you go further and if you go and see, and I saw uh, snakes, you know, the cobras on the temple and figures, and they were all dancing. And dancing as if, you know, that they're alive. And the, the gesture was such beautiful that you could see that they are floating. There is, they were all in Kumbhak. First time when I went to Vijay the Gime, and I saw everybody's belly was full. And I said, what kind of sculptures are these, the bellies? But they were all in Kumbhak, I saw in the end. So Kumbhak is when you are neither there or here. You are still. And in that stillness, there is life. This is what I have now understood. So when we teach, are we going to teach and put this observatory in such a place and then make it into a museum? Or we put it, you know, like scattered image in a public space so that anybody can come go up and down, raise questions, ponder over it, and perhaps gradually look up and down. And when he looks at the shadows, and then somebody says, but they are all instruments. Then they go to the real museum and they see models of the instruments. And then they realize that Jai Singh, the great mathematician, poet, statesman, is saying that, look, this is for you to play. You can get lost there. You don't have to think. But here is the real observatory where you have to spend time. So inhaling and exhaling and pondering. Do we really talk about pondering in architecture? At the moment, we are converting conversing now when we are looking at time and what not. What is that time? So timelessness is the essence of life. There is no purpose. It is nonsense. We have made a measure. We have made a line. We have made, you know, the ritual that this is right and wrong. How can there be right and wrong in the timeless world where you may be there, you may not be there. 
So, on one side, in terms of science and mathematics and everything else, it is there. But now they say, you know, that there is something else which we cannot say. And I think this is a philosophy which I think we should find. So you go to Jaipur or ancient places and you will find that the square is not exact square. Hmm. Slight error. And that error is made with an idea. So Vastu, Vastu Purush talks about this little error, error so that that instrument becomes alive. And to me, this is where we should discuss the emptiness. Yes. So what I'm taking from here, because I think what you have said requires a lot of deep uh, internalization. And I'm thinking that the last thing you said of leave the story incomplete. Yes. Let the questions float. Yes. When we make something, we are not making for this or for that. Yes. But we are leaving the question open. Yes. For everyone to discover. Yeah, what that is what I think uh, Madame Satar talked about, you know, the myth. Yes. Yes. And I think that myth is really saying, ho sakta hai, nahi bhi ho sakta hai. <laughs> Kumbak. Ah. <laughs> yes. Well, Doshi, thank you very much. It is like always, it is uh, something which is... Now, I just want to tell one little thing because I, I was about to, to bring the conversation to an end, but I have remembered something. So, you know, my friend Sohan, he mm. says that Ali Akbar Khan sahab, yes, when he is teaching, Somebody asked him, Kasa, what is a rag? Mm. Please explain rag to us. Mm. And he said that a rag, playing a rag, is describing a place where you have never been. That's right, yes. <laughs> you have to describe the place where you have never been. And that, that vast gap that you have shown in the mirror, you showed it initially and later now you showed it in the water and in the, in the relationship of the elephant and the lion and in the kumbak. And I think we will carry that with us. And maybe a lot of the people who are listening to this will want to ask you something about this. So sure. I'll end here and we'll move to the students who want to ask. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Professor Doshi. How are you? Good to ah, see fine. you. Fine. How are you? I believe we are going to excellent uh, programs you are having. So we've been having a wonderful time here. And um, uh, the kind of work that's uh, coming up, the conversations have been marvelous. And thank you for being here as well and uh, supporting us in this. Uh, uh, I so. think it is my uh, jo pleasure, not a question of supporting. It is nice to learn something more. So um, I will uh, open up uh, the uh, uh, for questions to both the uh, first to the panelists and then to the participants who are there. Good morning, Gulam Bhai. How are you? Good to see you. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, good to see you, Gulam. Hi. How are you? How are you? Fine. The guy came at night. I remember you. I remember you. You were our prerna. Who are you? Who are you? Prerna. I'm just a cover. But you are our prerna. You are our prerna. You are really an inspiration. Wonderful to hear you. Let us see what others ask you about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. For Thank you. And look good to see you. Lovely to see you. Let's see because these days we can't come physically. So this is the only way by which we can meet each other. 
Agreed. So maybe I will start with a question that has popped up uh, from one of the attendees. But it is a it's a large question, and I perhaps can start the conversation because Ashwini asks, you know, that uh, uh, there is a huge gap between reality and what we are discussing, uh, you know, and why is this always the case uh, when we are teaching or when we are uh, discussing? We are talking about these very very large things, poetic, mythical. And then there is, as we, uh, you know, kind of experience the reality of our cities, which I think you and Professor Chaya briefly touched upon. So I'd like to know how you would respond to this. Well, I tell you, I was thinking about it some time back. And I realized that there is something which we have overlooked. When I was a child, in my time, clothes were not required. You are, you are running in the house without any clothes. Very often I remember those days when I was crawling and I would go and find an insect on the wall, on the floor. Then I would look at them, I would touch them, feel them. As I was growing slowly, you know, I had no shoes, I had no other clothes and gradually I was touching with my hands. And uh, sometimes, you know, I would come near the staircase and there is no railing. And then I would look down and, you know, try to push my hand. And then I would realize I'm just recollecting myself, my childhood. And I would get a fear of falling. Now, those things were plenty. When I was sick, you know, for almost six months, there was no doctor, but I was experiencing all kinds of things in temperature, in anxious and noise and sound because I did not have many clothes on me, even though I was already 14 year old. Today, when the children grow, first we put down socks and then shoes and then clothes and then overcoats and whatnot. We dress them up. Do you know what is happening? We have lost all the ways to experience senses. We don't know what touches. We use a spoon. We don't know how to crawl. We also have a chair. We don't have a fear. We don't even think, you know, about going down the staircase. All those things have become even more and more. And now with the climate change and cold and fear of other things, we are adding a lot more. Where is our skin gone? Where are our subtle nuances gone? Where is the sense of touch that we had before? You know, when we used to get tea and then suddenly you touch and it was so hot, suddenly you know what that sense is. We have no sense left. And because of the sense which is not there, our inner body has become numb. And with that inner body which has become numb, we don't ask questions. We don't ask questions at all. We go into the market and we see things, but we don't know what they are, where they are, what it is. Everything is packaged. We are packaged, the product is packaged, our food is packaged. So really, are we alive at all, what we are talking all along just now is observations, absorptions, learning. And learning is not coming from somebody else, you're acquiring. We have lost the sense of acquisition of what is there, what is in the rain. What is there to dance, you know, into the rain, you know, naked and you go and wash, you know, and then suddenly you find that there is a puddle. Or you hold your hands and you slip and you hit your head. Now, all those things have gone away. We have almost become very similar to the robots. So can I ask the robot about all these things that we discussed? Timelessness, joy, forgetting things, memories, becoming. Where is that word? So my answer to this is, what is life? 
for me architecture is a living organism for me that living organism sense has happened because of my childhood and my not having anything else to hold myself up so when we don't have that what is the architecture there it is a space is a space the wall is a dead wall we are talking about inert matter we have not touched the feeling of cold and hot and humid and what not we don't know what thickness is we don't know even what second is now because we always will have a glove or something else so when you are detached from this all this discussion which has happened is about observation absorption reflection and creating something else out of this when i saw at konarak and when i told you about that elephant and the lion i would not otherwise have seen at all i had seen it before in a photograph and i could never understand but because i stood there for a while and i was watching it very carefully so what is happening what is taste good food good taste an expert expert you know in tea tasting and wine tasting and food tasting his tongue is tasting he is alive he is not taking a product so first thing to learn and to talk about is is what we do a product or it is something which is connected to us and to our inner core and i think that would be my question so observation if we can't do then we can't really look at what is going to happen because how do you know <coughs> what is the weather like how is the light is going to create a shadow all over old buildings ancient buildings were made with an idea that it will be seen because there was a ritual there was everything happening there music sa dance music literature philosophy and it was in different seasons in different ways and then there were stories talked about it and those stories were connecting life and all that put together became one thing so when we talk about rasa the theory of rasa is this that when you feel contented inside you when you get a burp and when you feel happy then you have understood the meaning of that food that you had and we have no time actually that question of timelessness doesn't come at all because we have no idea of time so it is not even necessary to discuss about time what is space i mean you know when you walk on the wall and you see the distance of the space and then suddenly you hit the wall and you realize that you have hitting in the wrong place you have not seen it now all those things are inner conversations our life was what we had like gulam is here and his age and my age and at that time we were experiencing deep inside all the things that we are now talking about as sensitive things meaningful things and i think those they are not there so what does it matter if a building is in glass i can put an air conditioner and make it comfortable when there was no air conditioning available and i used to work in the office on a tracing paper and if there is a monsoon and there is a dampness my hand would sweat and the whole tracing paper would wrinkle and i was not able to do anything but i was wondering but i knew what sweating is i knew what that paper felt and at that moment if i go to manak shop and if i see a little corner and if i see that fellow sitting in that very tiny small space under another space something like uh, up to only my shoulder and then i realize what that space means how to squat how to sit how to transact how to listen to that sound between when he is giving you pan and with the metal so all year everything was alive and i think first thing we should do in the school is take them there make them live there for a while experience this then i think we are doing something i don't know whether i have answered the question i can ask the question please please hi good to see you how are you 
Um, if I can uh, just make some quick connections and then pose a question. Uh, one is what you said just now. Uh, a second is what you said earlier that when we pass judgment, we cause separations. Mm. Um, a third is what Palasma writes about that we privilege focused vision, which creates distance between spectator and object. Whereas peripheral vision locates us within space because space comes to us. Yes. And then once we allow things to come to us, then the other senses, smell and sound, which are social, they, they reach out to us, come. And so we're allowing. So part of the, th you know, smell coming through breath, for example, we've forgotten how to breathe. So. Yes, absolutely. And then, then I connect that to uh, a conversation I remember you describing some years ago that you had with Stella Kramrish, where she talks about how the uh, great uh, temples, you know, actually breathe. Yes. So, so, so I was wondering if you could elucidate on that. What, what are the principles uh, we can uh, start looking for on how great architecture really breathes? Because uh, we have to learn to breathe, no doubt, but we also have to learn how to make architecture breathe. It's like talking about, you know, how do you really learn music? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a question of, uh, I can only tell you, when I was with Stella in, in Philadelphia, and uh, I was quite puzzled because she was a great scholar and whatnot. So, I asked her once, I wait and I do one column, you know, the South Indian column with the slight bulging things, you know, and going down like this. I said, Stella, we have this whole idea. And in the temple, we have all kinds of columns. Whether you go to Konara or you go to uh, a place uh, in Bombay or any ancient caves in Canary and others, you find those forms which were made very differently. And I was asking her, is there any reason for all this? So she said that there are sciences about breathing and the kind of way you breathe and you sense and then you learn about music. Your sensitivity will tell you about proportions. Sensitivity will talk to you about the kind of sonority that is there. Then you will understand poetry. Then you will understand literature. Then you will understand music. So she was explaining all this. But then she said that you are an architect. So I can tell you only one way. That there is energy pervading everywhere. And in temple, the energy has to be trapped. So when the Shastri, the, the sculptor or Vastu Shastri comes there for a temple, the walls are made. The columns are located and he looks back, backwards, forwards, etc. Then he finds a particular position. And when there is a question of installation of the deity or the idol, he looks at all this and all of this mind you have energies. It's like gathering few people and slowly in the music concert, eventually the energy comes and everybody gets engorossed. So then there is that chanting. And in that chanting, then there is the oil and then there is a ritual, you know, of uh, putting the God into the image there. And he says, once that image is put there, the entire thing gets charged. And she says, that is the secret of a temple. That everything is synchronized and there is an unusual rhythm. And that rhythm is connected to your inner breathing. And so good architecture breathes, good architecture senses, good architecture creates for you a response. And that's how he says, she said that the reverence comes. So this is what she told me. And that was the time I realized that those columns which I was talking about bulging in and out, whether it is in, uh, uh, in Bombay or uh, in the South, they are, they are there because they are all saying that we are alive, we are not static. It is not like our buildings in concrete, you know, where a column is almost so sharp and shiny and smooth that it doesn't have life. So it should be, can we sense life somewhere? This is really what I understood and this is how I try to practice. Professor Doshi, can I ask one question? 
Vikram Prakash from Seattle. <laughs> I, I tell you, I saw you two days back. But anyway, so nice to see you again. Yes. <laughs> it is always such a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, uh, and I, I, I sit and I've been wondering, you know, you're talking about making these wonderful uh, playthings, you know, putting the yantras uh, in, into the world so that uh, we can learn to play and there can be play and enjoy and delight and, and, and engagement with these things. And you are talking about, you know, how to uh, uh, not see from the third eye and sort of being one with your consciousness. And my question is about sadhana. Is like, what is the sadhana that we have to do now that I feel I'm very trapped in this uh, judgmental world to what is the daily practice that can help one, you know, get into that playful state? You know, that is my question. How do you sort of uh, turn, turn the start the wheels turning? Well, I don't know much about it, but I can tell you because of age and because of my tradition that I had. I used to do puja, you know, and then we used to have a ritual of Satyanara and Katha and all that. So myth of the Lord is there and then you are doing the ritual. As time went by and even now in recent times, if somebody asked me such question, then I wonder, you know, but there is also something to do with understanding our inner self. We are always outside us. Body is not really, we don't even, when we look at the mirror, we understand unless we cut something with our razor, we don't know that our skin is there. So the question is, if you are to become more and more aware, so one is that you must have less and less and less on you. Almost nothing. Second thing is that if you are going to be like this, then you ought to know about your breath and your body and your senses in the body and the rhythm of the, of the breathing that you have. Mm. So when you have less clothes, your thighs and legs and body and the shoulders and everything is such subject to subtle nuances of fragrance or the bodily temperatures or comfort conditions. Then you are doing this prayer and you are chanting and you are doing some ritual there. Slowly what happens after almost 10-15 minutes you know, so you get into that rhythm and you forget that you have a body, your breath goes down and your sleep, your breath is, breathing is less and less and you almost forget. And that is really what that ritual is. Now, when you do that ritual, what happens? First of all, when you go to do yoga today and exercises, we do that yoga, but we do this, uh, what they call, uh, Geometry, anyway, the new word, you know, which is there, but that yoga is fast and speedy. Actually, the whole idea is, we talked about timelessness, etc. Slowing down, doing things, having awareness and gradually that awareness to go right deep into the core. So in that temple, that ritual that is happening, if you are an outsider, you get bored, but that ritual is long enough to make you feel. And when you feel that, then you are connected to the surrounding. So there is that magnetic field, you know, which works without explanation. And you feel good. A lot of people say, I think I felt very nice. You don't have to go to a psychiatrist and ask, you know, do I feel nice or not? You know, he will say, just take relaxation, take some dose. So this is really what I know and I practice it. So for me, this has been a great lesson for me to understand. And then when I look at the wall or when I go to Banek Chok or when I go to a pan shop, I have learned to observe his dealings and the way he touches the water and he touches the leaf. And then I realize that pan is that so thin leaf 
and then he puts all the tuna, calcium, etc. But the way he puts it on that, that paper is very thin. If you go to a florist shop, he touches the flowers as if you know that he's really touching something which is very light. So when you observe these things, then you understand that everything has a weight, everything has some senses, everything is sensitive, and therefore you begin to not only appreciate, but you begin to connect. And I think that connection is what one is talking about. I don't know whether I have answered you fully. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think I have learned from you that I need to get naked and learn to be, learn to tune my body, tune my sense of self through, uh, through ritual or through whatever the ritual is, many yeah, rituals, many right. different ways. And then from that state of being, try and engage the world. Have I understood you a little bit? Yes, yes. I think what the most important thing is that you forget you exist in the end. Mm. You don't exist. That, that is, is very difficult. <laughs> no, I tell you why I'm saying this. Because Khan and Corbusier, I just bring back architecture here. You know. mm. When I was working with them, I had observed something which was unbelievable. Both of them. Corbusier would come and on the tracing paper, he would put the tracing paper and then he would take, both of them would take charcoal. Charcoal is a very nice thing so that you can rub it. You can take it with your thin hand and you have to draw, you can't really press. So when they were drawing this, like the Chinese do, they don't support their, their uh, this portion. But mm. If you are holding your hand and if you are touching this with this, slowly when you start drawing, your consciousness is now become very acute. Your eyes. So they were drawing something. Where does the image come from? You are not there. And that image when it comes, it tells the story of its own. And at that time, the story begins to tell you the story. And then there are pressures that happen on the line. And when that line is not good, they will rub it with their fingers and again draw again. But the hand then start moving and the kind of lines that would come for them, that is their music, that is their story, that is their kind of search. So really, we are, we are always having a reference here you have self-reference. And that self-reference is very important. You have become aware the world doesn't exist. So who are you? And that is really what we have to talk about in a sense. That we, we cannot talk just like that, spiritualize the matter. But the whole idea is that whatever we are doing, are we saying, whether it is architecture or a building or meeting people, are we really saying that am I doing this for somebody else or am I doing it for satisfying my inner self? Where am I at that point? And I think that is really the normal issue of everything. Because you ask all the questions that will come up and maybe I teach in the school and you ask somebody, can you, incidentally, when I taught the second year students, when I began my career, not knowing what to say, I asked them to draw an imaginary animal. For almost seven or eight weeks, they were doing imaginary animal. And when that came out, you saw fantastic drawings and you ask everybody. And can you believe that they talked about observations of the regular animals? And then these animals had to say, what is the ear for? What is the eyes for? What is this temperature? Why the skin here is, you know, with so many fur-like things on top? Why the tail is long? All kinds of things they were saying and they were talking about flies and insects and temperature and sitting and eating and searching the food and the digestion. Now, what is the difference between that design and designing of a house or a building? No difference. 
And that is where the building becomes dead because we are not searching for the life. Professor Doshi, if I can, uh, there are some related questions here from some of the participants. Uh, uh, and Mansi has uh, raised an issue based on uh, what you've been speaking, both with Vikram and earlier, uh, of this uh, need for self-referentiality, referring yes. to the self, which was mentioned, but also uh, losing the self uh, and losing the sense of uh, yourself. Uh, she asks, uh, in this how relevant is the aspect of otherness when one is looking from the lens of the mind for the evolution of a space, a city, or even oneself? How should one consider otherness? What is that other? You, what did you say? Yes, how, how should we consider other, the other? other yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, you are not considering other because there is no reference. When you are really yourself, you have already become other. Because compassion, sensitivity, relationships, you are already having within you. So when the, when the metal is hot or when you are near the kitchen, you know which is hot and which is cold. Or when you are drawing, you can know what it is like. So the question is, do we really have ever a self-conversation at all? And I think to me, at this moment, at this age, you know, I always ask this question. Am I really myself? When I do the buildings, for example, I started doing buildings and then I wrote myths. The myth was written only because I wanted to break the rule of my own understanding. Because that myth I was not able to comprehend. So the question is, can we really learn to raise questions for ourselves and impossible targets, unexpected targets. The moment we start talking that, then we say, do I walk straight? Do I climb there? Do I slide there? Do I do this? I have never designed, I mean, we normally don't think about all this like children would do or we, we are doing. We just draw the line, but we don't know what that line is implying to us in our, in our life. What does it mean? It is for somebody else. It is a product. It is for a market. And I think that is where the whole problem is. And I can tell you recently, I was telling Rajiv about the image that I had of Palladio and Palladio's architecture and Rotunda and all that. But when I went a few years ago again to see the Palladio's things, one thing I found that it was very grand and everything else, but almost, you know, static in a beautifully way done. Less windows, these high ceilings and everything else, but I didn't see garden there, far away. You know what the artist did? You go inside and you go into the room at a double height. And I saw the heaven in the ceiling painted. Now, where is the image now? The artist is talking about the heaven, giving you heaven there. So what am I offering? So Khan used to talk about offerings. So do we use those words and say, this is my offering to you? I think the moment that word offering comes, I think a lot of things happen by themselves. Because then there is a joy, there is reverence, and there is an attitude of, sharing something which is very rare. And I think that is where the difference is. I don't know whether I have answered the question. Uh, yes, no. yes no. Gulam Bhai. Yes. Can I come in? I mean, yes. is it possible? But I, have not, I have not posted a question. But please uh, ask it, uh, uh, Gulambai, no, no problem. Please. Uh, it's not uh, directly related, Balakrishna, but uh, it refers to what you spoke about the temples earlier and Stella Karamrish. And I began to think <clears throat> that Stella Karamrish herself has said that these 
monolithic temple, what you call temples, like Elora, or some yeah. parts of Ajanta, you know, are viewed in a way as though they were already there. Yes. What you did was to remove the outer covering. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? That yes, is, yes. In the rock, in the rock, the temple was already there. What you did was to remove the covering. So you you revealed that. That's right. Absolutely correct. You know, it is the kind of uh, existence. Uh, my which... thing about uh, the temple sculpture and temple leaves that I think original, it first yes. comes from uh, forming clay. And when you form clay, you have a living matter. Yes. Your voice is breaking. I'm going to hang tight. Huh? It's hanging. There's huh? some internet connection. Issues on his side. What a drama, che. Hmm. Oh. So, Professor Doshi, that's unfortunate. That was uh, uh, was uh, seemed like it was going to head to very interesting uh, decisions. Yes. We'll uh, we'll ask uh, Gulambai to come back in as soon as he rejoins the meeting. Uh, but. Uh, there's a there's a related question which uh, you know comes from uh, Anna, uh, who asks uh, empathy is a lot in our discussions. It seems as a group we are going to awaken <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. The, the connection is very uh, consistent, but anyway. What I was asking, one thing which I not, did not make very clear is that most of the forms seem to have grown inside outwards. Yes. That means they are full of form, like human body, you know. Yeah. And so there is kind of a sense of breathing which is incorporated yes. within that form growing inside outward. Now that's one thing. But what I was trying to ask you, was another question that if you were to do such a carving of a rock of that yes. kind, you know, a rock, which is a living rock, you do not know what is there inside, and you perhaps your technology or understanding of technology at that point of time told you that you could go right there up to 50 feet, 100 feet, and that rock will not disappoint you. You will be able to carve it. Yes. Now one question is, can you do architecture, which is not a built architecture, but which is still architecture, if you call it architecture, but it's also carved architecture. The whole thing has been carved out. Now there will also be questions of balances, questions of weights, questions of spaces, everything. But here the mind of, let's say, human mind combines the expertise of a sculpture and architecture. They come together in some kind of a combination where you are not building, you are actually carving out and see you see, there is the imagination of a sculptor and the imagination of an architect meet there and you produce something which is quite remarkable. Would you think that such a thing possible in our time? Do you think that this is worth talking about or just I want to know your thoughts? Uh, Golamba is uh... Almost now 50 years have gone by and I have gone to Kailashnath temple in Aurangabad. 
I have photographs of them on my table. What has been the most imaginative thing that I have all the time wondered is that when they do this carving from outside in and it goes up to 100 feet deep inside or down, down below and several generations have come and gone and there is no mistake in the whole sculpture or what that geometry and the stories that are there inside that building like the treasure, absolute treasure. Not only that, but there is, there are sculptures there like Ravan, you know, Sita Haran, and then there is a wall and there is a little chariot and all that goes. And I do, I all the time ask myself, who has guided that? And who was the one who left that place there? And who knew how to go inside your body and touch your soul? And I think this is something which I have been questioning for myself. Because as architect, we construct. What Stella Cramrich was talking was that even while you are constructing, the sense of assemblage is like creating a being. And in that being, all your senses, all your practices of body, mind, spirit, they all come together as if it is going to be a poetry which is going to be recited, but it is all in solid materials. Gradually, it comes together and the music starts. It's the reverse process that I'm talking. And I think that kind of a thing needs deep practices, understanding, humility, everything that is required because any error is, is the end of it. How can that building, you know, Kailash, which starts, starts, you know, at 100 feet up and goes down and sideways and it opens up and a building becomes completely independent, surrounded by the walls and rocks there. Is it possible to conceive this? And that is where I... I begin to think about that there is, what is the thing about breath, breath? How does the breath make us so subtle and so supple that we can feel it and that inner matter becomes almost alive? But that is, that is the sapatis of different kind. Sir, uh, Apeksha asks, uh, she was uh, intre interested by the idea of Kumbhaka that you had brought up and she asked, please share and guide your perception Kumbhaka in the urban you context. Bring art and architecture together. I tell you, I don't know, I am not a yogi or anything, but I know a little bit about things. But my guess is that when you close your nose, hold your breath, then you become breathless. But if you practice it for a while and gradually increase it, when you are feeling breathless, but then you are, your breath is going right into your subtle body, the sukshma, sukshma kendra. And in those subtle bodies, when it goes, then your real sense comes out. So in that Konara temple, when those people did this, I was quite surprised to see that how those couples together and uh, the animals and snakes, they were dancing. I was not hallucinated. But I have always wondered about it and admire and that is the thing which I think we have to find time and our education must have in the course every day, couple of hours. Because what is the profession ultimately doing? So in education, we are talking, we are talking about time and time bound things and all that. What is time bound for what purpose? So Kumbhak only tells me one thing that be yourself, be steady, be calm and be integral. Don't think of anything else around. So time and etc. doesn't work. 
Kumbak holds the time. I mean, all sculptures that we see, great sculptures, done, and most difficult part of architecture is constructing building is one story, but creating a sculpture, removing what is the unnecessary of the outside and creating the life inside, what Michelangelo was trying, that what was extra he removed and what really was the necessary, essential, was revealed. Now, who is revealing who? I mean, it was like positioning your position, taking the position of the creator. And I think this is something which is interesting. Are we really production people as architects? Are we going to be in business? Are we going to listen to some other people or we are going to collaborate together and create a guild? which will create for us something which is alive. I think the most important thing is this huge sense of aliveness. Incidentally, Manik Chok is the great place to see because there, there are a variety of scales. And those scales and the kind of uses of spaces which otherwise are unimaginable. And when you see them, and when you see them smiling and enjoying and doing their businesses, somebody is selling little things. What is important is, to me, that is architecture there. It is not a glass wall and a highly polished where there's no life, there's no chance, there is no touching. I think involvement of a participant is more and more important. And if you can connect it to the world outside, if your architecture can touch more people, more things, give them more ideas, then I think architecture will become alive. Otherwise, it is a dead thing. And this question so, was not asked before. So, Sad, we were, uh, I was asking a question uh, that Anna had raised uh, when uh, Gulam Bhai came back. Uh, she asks, she says that empathy has come up a lot in our discussions in the studio. It seems as a group, we are bigger, beginning to awaken ourselves towards architecture as a living being, which is also the way you have been describing it. Uh, and uh, she says, uh, Professor, she asks, Professor Doshi, do you think architecture can be built upon love? Can love be spatial? I think so. I can tell you the example. Supposing that I have to do a temple or a house and uh, I like the people and I like those friends and I want to give them as an offering. Now when I have to give them as an offering and it is not a very expensive house, uh, maybe two rooms and a place which is on the street, then I would like really that if the children come, if their friends come, how will they know that this is this friend's house? And then if they came and then there were three more people, but then where will they sit down? And then I would say, maybe a little place outside and I would create a plinth. But if that plinth is there and anybody can sit, but I would say, no, but if the child was there, I can make a little carving to that place and then add something more. And I would say that something can be added so that they can touch their hands and they can also add something there. So question is, architecture is, how do you ask the inhabitant and give him insights for further involvement and personal participation? I think that if it doesn't happen, he's an outsider. So architecture, activities, and the person who is living, they are all one. And what is their life? What is their joy? What is their history? What is it their aspirations are? And I think there are people, you know, when I did the Aranya housing and there are some photographs which I saw from people, how many ways they have added spaces to add, get more comfort and more facilities for the larger family. Because this is really what they want. They are talking about saying, I want home. I want place. I want my memories there. I want my joy there. Are we talking about these things at all? We are not talking all this. We just say function, sitting, standing, sleeping, holding, closing. What is this? 
So do we really ever talk of life, way of life, way of celebrating life, way of connecting generations and rejoicing that place? And I think if that can happen, it will be an active place. It will tell you the story about the kind of life that is there. Then it will become a true habitat. It will become living because it doesn't have style. It doesn't say it is looking good or not good. It has memories. It has associations. I mean, what is the... Di Do we ever think that architecture can... <laughs> I think this is the thing. Gulam is uh, this, not there at the moment. He is there, sir. So, uh... Sahana asks, to what extent is clarity safe to acquire and when is it good to let confusions be a possibility for speculation? <laughs> if I am crossing a road and the car traffic is coming, what is my clarity? Do I get jammed and crushed? Or I look around and become aware and I don't think about except saving my life. I think that is enough called clarity if I can save myself. <laughs> yes. May I request uh, some of the other panelists to, uh, to uh, ask and uh, engage? Uh, I'll uh, ask some of the other questions as we go along. Sure. Hello. Hello, Doshi, sir. Ah. How are you? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> it's nice to see you here. Yeah. Yeah. It resonated uh, with a number of uh, ideas that you shared today. And uh, uh, so, and it's so similar to some things which I have been talking about, writing about. Can I, can I share a couple of my small poems with you? Of course, of course. Go ahead. Like you talked about uh, losing identity, losing the I, you know. So... Yes. I've written this long back, like a wandering cloud wanders in the blue sky, yes. plays, with the wind, plays with the wind and sky, becomes the wind and sky, no cloud yes. left, no cloud left. The water over the stove boils, plays with the heat and air, becomes the heat and air, Yes. no water left. That's right. Watch it this. I become the cloud, I become the water, no shirish left. No shirish left. No, that is right because you have, you have become yourself. Yes. So. Actually, actually, the whole idea is that the whole vision of a cloud itself, you know, is a denial. I mean, it is an attempt to deny. But when you disappear, you have forgotten the name, you have forgotten your identity. And I think that is the ultimate piece. Yes. So if, if architecture has to be there and if the architect is not there, like for example, the Japanese buildings, when they do houses, they very often don't talk about the architect, you know, in a sense, old, I'm talking of the old ones. They always talked about the ultimate realization is when you lose your identity. Right. And I think that is the best thing to do. Is you lose, the moment you lose yourself, you are there. Yes. So fear should not be there of losing. Right. Yeah. I was actually, I was planning to come and meet you and talk to you about... <laughs> So many things, but then now this virus, Corona has come up. So maybe sometime when this all normalizes. Let's have a good time together, sure. Yeah, I, maybe I'll mail you something. <laughs> yes, thank you, Shirish. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, there's, a, there's an architectural question, uh, if I can put that to you. Uh, it's been asked by Nikita. Uh, and she asks, has modern architecture eliminated the possibility to express the stories that you were talking about, like the Sun Temple did, like you, like you spoke? Uh, sculptural expressions in architecture is today called ornament and 
is looked at as unnecessary. Expressions are rather abstract now. So in that sense, how can we record time through built form? Actually, it's, uh, it's a question with a lot of internal contradictions. If you are an architect, you already decided that you are an architect. And when you decide that you are an architect, you have got into a trap of the profession who calls themselves as architects. So you have voluntarily joined a clan whose rules you are following and not your own rules. So the one simple way is that don't join anything and become yourself and do what you like. And I'm sure you will see that it is very comfortable, very enjoyable, and it is very convenient, but it has not the professional identity, but your identity. I think that is what one should try to do. I was uh, remembering a drawing I saw of Jeffrey Bava, and uh, he had a balcony on the first floor bedroom. And on the drawing, he didn't label it balcony. He said, uh, a place to sit with your cup of tea and call the neighbor as he is passing by on the street. That's right. And, uh, and I was thinking that we uh, tend to label our plans with these functional labels. We say living room instead of a place for convivial gathering. We say dining room instead of a place for intimacy of people and the senses. So I was wondering if, if you have ever used that as a, as a strategy in design where you where you label what you have drawn in terms of experiences rather than functions. Well, when I did my last building after office was the Gufa. And Gufa has my identity, but I have lost my identity and I have been a very confused person, but I enjoyed it and I enjoy it all the time. The reason are very simple. I had decided to break all the rules that I knew. Second, I tried to do things, you know, which I had never done before. So everything in that Gufa I did, which I had not expected, not I was going. In fact, one day while the building was done and the floor was done, which is a sloping dune, I had gone to Bombay and came back and I had forgotten that the inside was that slope. I went there and I slipped and I hit my head on the floor. What I'm trying to say is that that was the time I realized that I don't know what it was. But in the end, I transformed it in such a way that it became a seashore. So the question is, you are not an architect. You are a sensitive being. You will relish your creations, including your blunders, but go it to the highest level, go and become ecstatic and play the game fully without thinking who you are. And I think that is what I learned from Hussein, that you are not an artist, you are not this, you are not this, you are so and so. And I think this whole debate on architecture and style and this and that is of no relevance. You should be what you want to do because then only your real thing will come out. Offering, when we go to the God, we don't say, what is that God and what is my offering? I think you go there and offer. And that surrendering is very important. I think in the profession and in ethics, we should surrender. Then there are no mistakes. It is merging. Uh, since since you have raised the Gufa, if, if I can ask a follow-up question. The, the first time I saw it, it was still uh, uh, being constructed. Most of the structure was up, but not completely. And and uh, and Raji was taking me around and, and explaining how it was being made. And uh, it was this very unusual combination of high technology and the touch of the crafted, you know, the crafted touch of the hand. Uh, and uh, so I was wondering if you'd care to elaborate on that, uh, how that has affected architecture. Actually, after I stopped teaching, 
I was uh, not knowing what to do and then Hussein was wanting to have a gallery. And so one fine morning he came and he says, you know, I gallery a gallery, so I need 500. I said, come. And then I remembered his comment on architecture and saying, there was summer mein garam hota hai, is mein ye hota hai, tumhare makan achche nahi hote hai. So I told him that you have been challenging me, now I'm going to challenge you. So it was a challenge, friendly challenge. What he cannot put on the wall, what he cannot display, I will create that Un unexpected thing. So when it was built, then he came with his uh, um, promoter from New York and uh, Chester Harwitz. And he came with a canvas and he says, I'm going to show you what though she has done as a gufa. So he came and then he put, right, trying to put that canvas on the curved wall and the canvas failed a couple of times. He got Velcro, this, that. So finally he stopped painting. So he did not know what to do. After almost a year and a half, because it was a, something that he couldn't paint, he could not think anything, but he was careful about architecture. And he did not know what to do. So finally, one day he arrives after almost a year, a year and a half, truckload of huge cutouts, big, almost two and a half, two meters, two and a half meter high. And those we placed them together. So what he really was doing was, if there is no architecture, let me do sculptures. What is my identity? So it was not the painting, but it was this because I had challenged him. And I say, Tum batao, tum kya karoge? Tumne to bahut painting kya? Abhi karke batao mujhe. So this is really what is important is one must constantly be under challenge. And one must not have a definite idea of who he is. So why not become a child of the universe? And do what your instinct tells. What has happened is that nowadays, we are following somebody, following this, following a trend. So all the time we need to follow somebody. But it's nice sometimes to go yourself alone and play the game. And it's a discovery. So that was my gift to myself as, a, as if, you know, that I want, and every time I go there, I always wonder when the sunlight comes when the sun changes the angles or when you, you, you see the people walking there and playing, there is no identity. It is not architecture. It is neither a building. It is just a place, a place where you rejoice. And then I wrote the myth, you know, about the Cobra and Pithora Baba, you know, and then that is how then you do. So I think what is required, I mean, at least what I try to do is, if I remove my architecture by working with Corbusier, Khan, this, that, etc., all the layers are removed, then I said, am I not a child of the universe? Can I not have a right to play myself? Can I not become like the early childhood that I was about to fall on the steps down and I was always on the verge? Why? Because when I saw the Kailash temple and other temples, I saw that this is really where the whole idea of being comes. They were, they were all creative people, but who had come through yogi, or I don't know what practices, but they had visualized things which were far beyond my comprehension. So realization has to come from going deep inside and getting completely lost. And what's the harm in getting lost? You were not supposed to be there anyway. I think that's all I can say. Professor uh, <clears throat> Doshi, I want oh. to ask you something. Um, you know, in uh, 2003, or it may have been 2004, I was in your office with you, and uh, you were working on a house. And you showed me this house, and uh, that you showed me the plans, and it looked... Uh, there was this staircase that looked like uh, it was from a Hindi movie. In fact, you told me that uh, Bollywood was its inspiration. It was this curved staircase which went up. Uh, I think uh, it might have been a few months later and uh, I returned and you were very excited at having seen Harry Potter. 
and the moving stairs there and we were talking and you were imagining what if the staircases could move like they do at Hogwarts. Finally, when the building got built in Manisha's house uh, and the staircase was there, you talked about it as if it is the on the banks of the river uh, at Banaras. And all these stories have uh, kind of talked about a particular uh, imagination. And uh, I can imagine that it is the challenges and the kind of, uh, as you said, the childlike uh, constant uh, search. Now, you also talked about the challenges that we set ourselves. And one of them is that uh, architects and around the world now talk about doing things which are new. I sense that uh, when you are doing these things, that the idea is not to create something new in the sense that it is talked about uh, uh, in the profession. I would like to understand uh, when you talk about doing everything different or new every time, what do you actually mean by that? Actually, I don't talk about newness. I talk about the kind of joy in living differently or living in a different way. So that Manisha's house take is change in different ways from Bollywood to Kerala and then it became a platform and it, there are huge four columns there and a small little niche there almost like a temple. The whole idea was I was trying really to search about life. And in life, uh, really, what is it that you do? You sit, first of all, everywhere as human beings, you want to sit somewhere. And then you want to have parties, and then you want to have celebrations, and then you still want to have your own memories. And yet, you know, you want to have some kind of relationships, you know, and for uh, conversations, gatherings, and whatnot. And on top of it, you don't want to get bored. So the only way to think about that was, that is there any way that I can find that when the sun hits their house every day, the spaces, reflections, shadows change and it doesn't look the same. Seasons come and of course sometimes even the house leaks. But anyway, the houses, you know, with water and others there. Then when you have guests, you know, then where do you treat the guest? Do you treat the guest inside, outside? You can sit on the floor, you can sit with chair. So what I was trying to do was playing a game with myself, with all the tools that I learned as an architect. So what is this? So one is the scale, second is relationship, third is the kind of spatial innovations and experiences. The fourth one is variations. And fifth one is that anywhere you sit, you won't know whether you were there before or not because the light has changed, the color has changed, etc. So really it was for me a model, full size model, which I don't have to move, but if I was doing, I can really play the game all the time. And I feel that I am in a place which I always enjoy. And I don't know what it would be like when there is a big party or a small party. I mean, it was the time I would work here in Chai. I used to also come and we used to discuss. And I was talking about, because my wife said that you have to only use half the property. So 250 yards I can get. So I made a wall in between and we discussed with Varki and Chaya about the nature of wall. The wall, which is a neighbor's house, which is broken. And that wall is still standing there. So then the next question came when not only the wall, but what is the nature of the platform that connects the wall? The other thing that was there was that when you have a wall and this, what kind of a function that would could have in the house? So uh, what I did was between three of us, we used to discuss about various alternatives and various ways of experiencing things. So it was never then designed as a house. It was designed as a, as a what you call a stage, uh, places which created various things which you can always use. So that is one house which doesn't have a standard things. Even the staircase is so big 
then you can go and go touch the other wall and do, which I'm going to make a railing there so that you feel you're dancing when you're going up. So architecture is not really, what is it? Architecture is the joy of experiencing life. So I call it celebrating life. Acrobat, acrobat or yogi, sir? Which is it still? Both. Actually, when, uh, you know, yo when he is not yogi, he is an acrobat because otherwise he cannot become a yogi. How can he become? Because he has to change himself. I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying, interpreting uh, the mind of a yogi whom I don't know. <laughs> Experiments. Unusual ways of looking at things and doing things that you never had thought before. I think that is the key of living life. Why should one go at the same time, same place, same dinner, same place? I think it's very boring. So, you know, it's really why can't we remain a child of the universe? That's the point. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we've been uh, here almost uh, two hours. And, um, you know, I, we've, uh, all your, um, so many of us here are your students. And uh, we know that you could go on for another two hours. There's no problem there. I have no, seen I'm the... Not drive. <laughs> So, so we have seen how you drive some 27 year old who's working on a plan with you, you know, and grind them to dust over the day. So, I mean, I, that's there, but, but, you know, and one wants to ask you about this, this, this vital energy that you have. And, and Santesh has asked uh, uh, this in a particular way about this, this energy. He says a path like what you are describing is an endless one. There is no destination to reach uh, but only striding on the path in full stride uh, and in extension to Vikram's question uh, where are we heading how can we slow ourselves from the rush and the noise this is I think it's a good question to end with please why this question how can we slow you're already slowing down no it's all a mindset if you are constantly trying to be in bliss, enjoying yourself and feel happy, you don't know what time it is. It was not there before, it will not be there after. I don't think so because I think we, we say I have been committed. What is your commitment? There's no commitment. All of them are transactions. I have always dealt like this. My commitment, I was in the school and my commitment was to teach. But it was never that I had to fix a schedule as long as I spend time with the students. So why should I really inter interpret a mechanical way of living? I think every word has its own meaning if you can be free. And I think the idea is to rejoice. Whatever happens, what, what, what can happen? You can always change, you know. Client wants to change, you can't change. He pays money, but are you not spending time? So you can also tell the client that, look, let's have a dinner together and we change in the evening and so what? So I don't have take restrictions as, as main things. At least so far I have not done. Professor Doshi, thank you. Thank you so much for this time and uh, what has been a wonderful time and, uh, giving me a chance to meet all, all of you after a long time. I am really, very, very pleased. And Shirish, so we'll meet soon. And of course, Riaz. Thank you. And uh, uh, Professor Doshi, please come in uh, and uh, you know join all the conversations from here on. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here again. No, no, I'll come soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, especially this evenings with when Gulam is going to speak. Yes, I will come. What time is it? 
Five o'clock. Okay, I'll be there. I'm here only, so I'll see you. Sure. Thank you, Chaya. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.